Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Lodge, President of the Atlantic City Branch of the NAACP, welcoming you to the August 25th edition of your NAACP speech. Uh, today, we are very saddened by the uh, incident in Wisconsin where Jacob Blake was shot by police officers in front of his three children and he's now paralyzed. So we ask for prayers for the Blake family and for his recovery. And I'm just wondering why unarmed black men continue to get killed while white men armed and unarmed who have done things that would require them to be arrested by law enforcement don't get killed. And that's something that we have to ask ourselves as a nation and but we have to put a stop to that. Uh, we salute President Hawks as we do every week and our superior engineering staff uh, for the program. Uh, we heard every Tuesday, 88.7 and 100.3 on WEHA from 4.30 to 5.30. Uh, as we are closing out our second month of our membership drive, we just want to thank everyone who has given and been supportive of the membership of the NAACP. Our drive goes into September uh, and we appreciate and we need your support and we need your membership. As we do every week, we uh, mourn the people who have lost their lives to the virus here in New Jersey and across the country. Uh, this is a terrible virus that is taking the lives of too many of our citizens and we pray uh, every day for a vaccine uh, that will stop uh, this virus. Additionally, uh, as we move forward uh, on the NACP uh, speaks, uh, you'll be hearing more about the Institute uh, that we're starting. We talked about that at the last week's program, uh, the Institute for Youth Leadership, uh, named after John Lewis and uh, Jim Cooper, a local civil rights attorney here in the Atlantic City area. And we'll be asking for your support for that. Uh, that is a worthy activity, and we appreciate uh, your support of that. Uh, having said that, I will turn it over now to our host, our co-host, uh, Yolanda Melville Esquire. Good afternoon, Yolanda. Good afternoon, President. I am delighted to be here. Another week of our NAACP Speaks. As many of you know, um, Zoom has given us some difficulties, and although we are vigilant, we are certainly still socially distanced. So we are broadcasting through Zoom. So I apologize if there are any uh, technical difficulties that arise over the next hour or so. But I want to um, tell everybody around the country to stay encouraged as, as President Shabazz says, we are certainly um, devastated by the tragic incident that happened in Wisconsin, but we are certainly still vigilant on what we can do in our community, educating ourselves, voting, and definitely being active in our communities when it comes to solidarity and community um, activism. So we know that this is a year of elections as any year is. And we've also always encouraged everyone in our community to be registered to vote. And here in New Jersey, as we quickly turn over to our guests, I want to remind you all about the requirements to vote here in New Jersey. One, you have to be a United States citizen. You have to be at least eight, 17 years old but you may not vote until you're 18 years old. You have to be a resident of your particular county for 30 days or more prior to the election and new this year, if you are someone who's on probation or parole or you have a brother, sister, friend who is on probation or parole, they are certainly eligible to register to vote. So we encourage them to vote in this election. And of course, our registration deadlines are 21 days prior to election day. So what does that mean for the upcoming general election? Well, it's very simple. The general election remains Tuesday, November 3rd. Our voter registration deadline is Tuesday, October 13th. Tuesday, October 13th is the last day that you can register to vote here in New Jersey. And as we gear up for the next six weeks of voter registration and voter turnout over the next two months, we will continue to remind you all about those deadlines, November 3rd for the election and Tuesday, October 13th for registration. But we understand, President, if I'm not mistaken, this is 
likely this is going to be a mail-in ballot election so there will be an opportunity to vote prior to november 3rd and we will be discussing that in greater detail as the elections um the election cycle approaches we are in the midst of us having a membership drive as president shabazz has stated if you'd like to be a member of the atlantic city naacp you can join by visiting naacp.org forward slash become a member you type in 08401 click search and we are branch number 2077b atlantic city branch and a one-year annual membership for an adult is thirty dollars and youth memberships are ten dollars if you'd like to send correspondence directly to the atlantic city naacp you can do so through our mailbox at p.o box 1182 at Seekin, new jersey 08201 and as i wrap up announcements i know that our mayor small is here so whenever he's ready we can turn quickly over to him because this is time to make announcements but i do want to remind everybody that this is the a week of the march on washington and you can participate in that virtually by texting POWER, P-O-W-E-R, to 40649, or visit naacp.org. That starts Thursday, October 27th at 8 p.m., and will continue on until Friday, August 28th, from 9 to 11. Mayor Small, are you available? Yes, how you doing? It's a great day here in the city of Atlantic City. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon. So certainly he, has some, he we've been having some zoom difficulties so we uh, hopefully he'll, <laughs> okay well he's there but he, he can't see him for now but we give you the opportunity the floor to make your announcements whenever you're ready um how you doing um uh, once again uh the city of atlantic city you know we're moving forward um we have an, uh, we had an engaging discussion at the council meeting regarding short-term rentals and the ordinance was subsequently pulled by city council. We are attempting to put together a group on both sides of the aisle to come out with the best outcomes. We know that Airbnbs cause a problem with noise, uh, trash, um, you know, all types of violations, parking issues. And this administration is temp attempting to grab the bull by the horn. The city currently didn't have any uh, policies and regulations. And we're moving forward to, in that direction. And, um, you know, we're just excited about the outcome. Also a controversial measure that was pulled off of the city council agenda, which is the removal from the planning and uh, planning board and civilian advisory board, um, citizens advisory board. Um, that is going to happen on a special meeting on Friday where city council will entertain a resolution. We know that Mr. Young is having a scheduled march potentially with George Floyd's brother. Listen, for the millionth time, I'm a black man and I agree that black lives matter, but it's a way that we have to conduct ourselves and any negative attention and energy uh, towards the city, you know, will not be tolerated. I understand that, you know, he wants to paint black lives matter on a boardwalk. Once again, I'm all for Black Lives Matter. But if, you know, permission was given, which it won't be, to paint that, what, what, what is that going to do for the movement? It's not about uh, a mural. It's not about painting the street. It's about action and a lifestyle. And we support people's peaceful, peaceful right to protest. But at the same time, um, you know, we, we, we won't allow the boardwalk uh, to have Black Lives Matter mural on it. And that's my five minute update and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. All right. President Shabazz, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, Yolanda, we want to again thank the mayor for his uh, input. Uh, as we said before, uh, the mayor, we think in our opinion is doing an excellent job. He is rational and forward moving and he's been a member of the NACP just for the record before he even started running for the mayor him and his wife, and we appreciate uh, his continued support. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have uh, two very transformable, transformable guests uh, that we appreciate uh, because this is uh, the month uh, that we celebrate the suffragists, the women getting their right to vote in America, and that is very, very key. And we have two uh, outstanding guests. I, I guess they're your guests, uh, Yolanda? 
They, yes, they are. They're my guests. <laughs> <laughs> this is the 100th anniversary I, of the women's suffrage movement. So why not? Well, listen, I, I'm a supporter of women's uh, suffrage movement and women's right to vote. How come uh, one of them can't be my guest? Or, 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 or we could see them. Or... Black men have oh, the right well, since uh, 1870. So I think you have five, 50 years before us to find <laughs> another guest. So oh, I, think my. The, I think the women of, the, of this um, illustrious program today should be mm -hmm. my guest. But you know, in right. the spirit of solidarity, we can share them. Well, they, they are outstanding women and uh, outstanding public servants, and we uh, salute them. And just let me say for the record, uh, one of your guests, one of our guests, is going to be Amy uh, Kennedy, who's running for uh, Congress. And for the record, the NACP does not endorse candidates. We do ask people to vote, as Yolanda said in her uh, announcements, and we ask people to take part in the process. We've contacted uh, Congressman Van View, and Congressman Van View is going to be our guest on September the 29th. Uh, so um, I wanted to say that for the record, uh, Yolanda, so everyone will be clear uh, that even though we are uh, excited to have Miss um, Kennedy on, that the NACP is a it's a nonpartisan organization and that we encourage people to vote as i said before but we do not endorse candidates uh, so I, I wanted the record to be clear on that uh, but we are very happy to have uh both of our guests on today and uh, we are happy that uh more women are being are running for office uh, more women are being uh, considered for appointments in government, and we are way behind in this country with women leadership. And uh, I'm happy to say uh, that in the NACP, we are supportive of women going and doing whatever uh, they want to do in terms of government and public service. So, President, it appears that uh, freeholders seem to be County Commissioner Fitzpatrick is on the line. So whenever she's ready, can we go ahead and get started with her interview? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Mrs. Fitzpatrick, are you there? I'm muted. Are we good? I'm muted. I am okay. not. I am muted. Hello. Yes, there, we there we go. Hello. Hello. No, that's all right. As we re remind our guests on the airwave, we are conducting these interviews via Zoom because we are active but still socially distant. So we are uh, handling a few technical difficulties in the background, but I think we've, we've resolved them. So I think we're ready to go. President, can we start the first interview? Yes. Karen Fitzpatrick, welcome to the NACP Speaks. We are honored to have you as our guest. Uh, just for the record, Karen Fitzpatrick is a active member of the Atlantic City Branch NACP. She's also a member of our uh, Infant and Maternal Task Force, and we are proud and honored to have her as our guest. And just for the record, before she gets her formal introduction, she was ahead of the issue of changing uh, from the term freeholder to commissioner. In 2018, she introduced a resolution. It was defeated, but she had resilience and she stayed with it. And we know uh, this, this Saturday, this Friday, I'm sorry, the governor signed that a piece of legislation into law. And we think that's important. And we say thank you. Over to you, Yolanda. To, to Yolanda or to me? Uh, to Yolanda. OK. For introduction. Okay. Well, welcome. We know we're on the uh, historic cusp of the 100 year anniversary of women's suffrage. So what you did as far as being an advocate for change is, is something that we have known that women are powerful around the country have done. So I just want to give kudos to you for your efforts and your heroic efforts to change something or be the, the foresight of, of, of a, a huge change for the community. So thank you. But I'll start with your, your bio and then we'll get into the first question. Is that all right? Of course. Go right ahead. Okay. So, as I said, Freeholder Fitzpatrick, soon to be County Commissioner, is the Director of Finance and Administration at Meet AC, 
the organization that is charged with bringing meetings and conventions to Atlantic City. The Meet AC is an economic development agency and is committed to, committed to the success of Atlantic City. She's worked there for more than 20 years in both oh, no, the no, four, no, no, no. oh, she, you worked for 20 years in for-profit and yes. non-profit organizations. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you have a deep and varied experience in budgeting, forecast, forecasting, and fiscal responsibility. You've lived your whole life in Atlantic County, including spending years in Pleasantville, Summers Point, and Linwood. You graduated from Mainland Regional High School, Atlantic County, Atlantic Community College, and have a degree in accounting. Thomas Edison State College, where you have a business degree, a business administration degree, and Stockton University, where you have a master's in business administration. Freeholder Fitzpatrick's father was a professor of philosophy at ACC and taught you to question everything. Freeholder Fitzpatrick believes in people, their right to equal opportunities, and the amazing diversity of our county. She believes that we are all better off when we learn about each other and celebrate our differences as well as our similarities. Freeholder Fitzpatrick is a feminist, meaning that she supports all people having an equal voice in their lives. She states that we all prosper when we have a variety of opinions and thoughts regarding the decisions that we make and everybody brings something unique to the table. She also says, I'm persistent. And some of the best advice she's received in her life was from her Aunt Judy, who told her, be pushy, dear. I don't like to give up, is what a freeholder Fitzpatrick says, and won't give up when acting on the behalf of the citizens of Atlanta County. She believes that everyone deserves a shot at the American dream. But all too often, we are not working with a level playing field. Advantages and privileges exist in communities while others are left behind or left out. She believes that good government has the ability to equalize the balance of power and give everyone the opportunity to succeed. So welcome, Freeholder Fitzpatrick. The first question, yes, round of applause. Thank virtual you, round of applause. First question is, we want you to tell our audience three things about you. Okay. Um, the first thing is that I am solution oriented. I'm a problem solver. Um, sometimes that gets me into trouble because people just want to tell me what's going on and I'm jumping right to fixing it for them. So I always have to check myself and, and work, uh, work up to that and see if they need my help, want my help, but that, that's one of um, my strengths, I hope. Um, every year, uh, every New Year's for my resolution, I resolve not to gossip. And that, that is uh, very important for me. I like to see with my own eyeballs, what, what things are going on. I don't like to listen to hearsay about situations. If I don't see it, I, I am very skeptical, skeptical because people will talk and I, I want the truth, the actual fact. Um, and then finally, I enjoy traveling because as, as you read, Yolanda, I really enjoy learning about all different people and geographies and finding out how to incorporate that, the, that knowledge, that newly gained knowledge into my life and my um, surroundings and the people around me. Well, welcome. Thank you. So the next question is for you, President. Do you have a question for Freeholder Fitzpatrick? Yes, can you tell our audience what moved you to put your resolution in to change the terminology from freeholder to commissioner? Sure. Well, you know, when I ran in 2017 and knocked on doors all over the county, nobody knows what a freeholder is. And so I did some research into the term and found out what it meant that um, only people who held their land free and clear could vote and hold public office, elected office. And of course, that meant the majority, uh, the ruling class, white men, uh, not women and not people of color. So th that bill had actually been bouncing around our state legislature for a couple of years and not gone anywhere. It was, it was actually proposed by a Republican from northern New Jersey. And, um, and I brought it forward at our freeholder meeting in July of 2018 
and was told that I was misinformed. I didn't know, you know, what I was talking about. I was wrong. And uh, uh, quite obviously, the freeholder board had no appetite for this. And so it, it just floundered. Until earlier this year, a couple of freeholders from, uh, I want to say, central New Jersey um, brought it forward to Governor Murphy, who is quite open-minded and ready to listen. And now here we are, the assembly passed it, the Senate passed it, and it was signed into law on Friday. And January 1st, the term freeholder will be no more in Atlanta, in New Jersey. We will be, if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected, county commissioners, which people have an idea what that means. Very good. Yolanda, your question? So the next question is actually a lead in from your statement. Interestingly, 19 county commissioners of color unanimously supported and advocated for that change. How does that make you feel? Well, it makes me feel validated. Apparently I did know what I was talking about. I wasn't misinformed and I wasn't wrong. And it, you know, it took other people from around the state who had a, a vested interest in promoting equality because words matter. You know, if you use words of oppression, words of anger, words, uh, negative words, that becomes normal. And we, they, we have decided that we're not going to do that anymore. New Jersey was the last state to use that term. And they, uh, you know, the people who um, told me I was wrong uh, find it, you know, uh, uh, historical and, and um you know, part, part of their, the culture of New Jersey. That's in the past. And, and that's okay, it's okay, we'll put it in the past. And let's move forward with a more comprehensive term that isn't insulting really to anyone. And it does explain what our job is, it's county government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Freeholder, one of your issues is opioid addiction. Tell our audience why you feel so strongly about it and what can uh, groups like the NACP and people concerned do about it? Sure. sure. Thank you, Councilman. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, w I lost one of my children to the opioid crisis six years ago. And it's taken me six years, actually, to be able to talk about it. Um, I am involved in uh, trying to get rid of the shame and stigma that is associated with heroin use. Um, because we're in a different world now and, and a lot of people who become addicted to heroin start with prescription drugs or prescription drugs that their friends have. And, and that's what happened to my son. His uh, friend had a sports injury, a knee injury. And you know, kids party and, and that's what happened. But just like some people are alcoholics, and have, have trouble turning down a drink, other people are, are more susceptible to addiction of, of opioids. So uh, when that starts and then you know you get prescriptions for Xanax or something like that, and then that prescription runs out, then you go to the street and it's very difficult. And the problem is the stigma and the shame keep people from seeking professional help. You try to fix it yourself. And unfortunately, that was my case. I mean, I consider myself a fairly intelligent person, but I didn't know how to handle that. And this was my, you know, both of my children are stars, but this one was, was amazing. A AP student um, played the mm. tuba, was athletic. And then I can pretty much pinpoint the week in his sophomore year of high school where he did a 180. And we were so shocked that we were in denial for a long time um, because we couldn't believe it. this this was my my sweetie boy and uh, so that, that's why um, I am involved in trying to to destigmatize the the uh, disease of addiction so that people won't feel like they can't be public and or at least ask for professional help because that's how how you can recover and you can recover and people do recover and they go on to live very productive and happy lives. It's a disease, just like diabetes. It's a chronic disease. So that, that's why I'm involved. Let, let me ask you another question. Uh, 
is it true that there's a rise in the numbers of people of color who are involved in addiction? And if that's true, how should we address it? <clears throat> well, uh, yes, it is true. I, I did some research this morning in preparation and I found that uh, from 20, 2014 to 2017, the overdose death rate um, in non-Hispanic black population increased 818% in those four years. And that has to do with fentanyl, Vicodin, uh, Oxycontin, synthetic opioids. Uh, similar similar uh, statistics for the Latino community. And we hear about, uh, you know, the, the majority of people who overdose or die are white, but that's because there are more white people. So the per you have to look at the percentages, not the not the actual number count. And mm -hmm. yes, the pro there is a growing problem. And so what we're trying to do is make people aware. And, and can I give a little plug to our Monday? Um, Go right ahead. Okay, great. So Monday at six o'clock, um, Recovery Force, which is a local chapter of a national organization, is having uh, their annual overdose awareness night in McClinton Park in Atlantic City. And we chose Atlantic City this year because we wanted it to be a diverse and all-encompassing um, uh, event. And uh, we're going to be talking about stigma and shame and how it's okay to ask for help. And in fact, it's needed. You must ask for help. Nobody will, will uh, think any less of you for that. So that we are doing that in Atlantic City this week. Um, it starts at six, but at 4.30, from 4.30 to 5.30, Sheriff Scheffler is going to be doing some Narcan training, which will help save some lives. Um, you know, if, if you uh, treat someone with Narcan who is apparently overdosed, it will revive them. And it's very easy. I took the training. It's not medical. It's really easy. Everybody should do it. Keep it, you know, along with you. Um, so, so uh, yeah, the, the, the populations are growing. It, this this disease is like lightning striking. It can hit anybody, and it does. It really does. Thank you. So that's a good answer. Uh, Freeholder, soon to be commissioner, we have one minute. Do you want to close with whatever uh, final statements you want to have? And again, we thank you uh, for coming on. We salute you for your courage uh, with uh, following, the following the resolution and staying on it uh, with the change. And when the history of this is written, uh, the name Karen Fitzpatrick will be prominently figured in this time. Thank you again. You got 60 seconds. Thank you very much, Councilman. Um, I, I did want to, we, did, we didn't touch on the Black Infant Maternal Mortality Task Force. I just wanted to give that a plug as well. Um, that, that's a very strong movement that's happening in Atlantic City. Um, very important because, you know, as a mother, uh, I understand what, how it feels to be frightened when you're pregnant and you don't know what's going on. You need support and we need to help the, uh, this population whose mortality rate is four times that of the state of New Jersey. And that's, that's horrible. That's just horrible and we have to fix it. And so that's why I wanted to get involved in that. Thank you so much. Listen, we'll have you back on again with, uh, Mandy uh, Chapman Days, who is our chair, because we want to push that issue because it's important. That's why we set up a task force. We thank you for serving on it. My uh, pleasure. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, you Priolder. Okay. Yolanda, I see our five o'clock guest has arrived. Good afternoon, uh, Amy Kennedy. Uh, before you came on, Amy, uh, Yolanda and I, we have a friendly rivalry as to who gets the credit for having inviting a guest. But I think she's taking advantage of me because I'm a late person and she's a lawyer because she gets all of the guests, women or men. When we had the attorney general, she got him because they went to the same law school. When we had the prosecutor, she got him because they went to Howard University together. Today, is uh, we have women, uh, we're uh, honoring women for getting the right to vote. So we have Freeholder Fitzpatrick and you, and she got both of them. So I'm victimized, but that's neither here nor there. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to the, the Atlantic City NACP Speaks. We're so uh, honored to have you, uh, Amy, uh, on uh, as our guest today. 
See, I know why you are successful, Councilman. It's because you know where to give credit. And it's important. Stick with that program <laughs> and give Yolanda the credit and you'll do just fine. That's well, it. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you, Amy. Good um, to see you. Good to see you too. And, and thank you for being our uh, studio audience as we were listening to Freeholder Fitzpatrick as well. She's the best. Isn't she the best? I know. And I know she's still on listening. And Karen, I just thank you so much for sharing your own personal story. Um, it, it just gives so many people strength to get the help and find the resources that they need. That's what Karen's been doing for our community for a long time now. And we all appreciate it. Thanks, Amy. I look forward to working with you. So welcome, Mrs. Kennedy. Um, if you are elected in November, you will be the first Congresswoman who is a female from our congressional district. So that is monumentous for um, many reasons. And as we celebrate the 100 years of women's suffrage, we thought it was perfect for you and Freeholder Fitzpatrick to talk about those um, incredible feats that you all are doing as, as trailblazing women. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I have um, a live in Brigantine and I have a story about my great grandmother. Her name was Elizabeth Daly, lived here in Brigantine also. And she was one of the first women to vote in uh, New Jersey. So mm. she, I had the chance to meet her. She lived to be 106. So um, she mm. was around for quite a long time. She was a seamstress and lived here in Brigantine for uh, her, you know, adult life. And my her husband, my great grandfather, was a letter carrier. Um, I mentioned that my great uncle was a letter carrier when I saw you, Councilman, uh, talking about how we need to preserve preserve the post office. But she was one of the first voters here, and I'm so proud to have that kind of legacy in New Jersey. Let me just say uh, very quickly, Amy. I want to thank you and all those who came out for our press event in front of the post office in Lang City. Also, freeholder. Fitzpatrick was there uh, and several other uh, people and we appreciate all of you. That's an important issue. The NACP is going to stay on that. We have to have a postal service that works. And unfortunately we have uh, people who want to slow the postal service down. We're not going to allow it. I'm sorry, Yolanda, I just wanted to put that in. That's right. So that's right. So we're going to get into your bio and then we're going to hear three things about you that you'd like to tell our audience. So for those who do not know congressional candidate Amy Kennedy. She is the education director of the Kennedy Forum, where she pursues partnerships and collaborations that emphasize evidence-based research and programming to facilitate policy change in the areas of education and mental health. An educator by training, Mrs. Kennedy, or Amy, has more than a decade of experience working in public schools in New Jersey. Her experiences as a teacher and a mother of five propel her efforts and advocacy around social emotional learning and mental wellness for children and adolescents. Amy serves on the boards of Mental Health America, a leading national advocacy organization, and Parity.org, which promotes gender parity at the highest levels of business. She is an advisory board member of Interaxon, Interaxon? Yeah. Interaxon, a mental health technology company. Set to Go, a program that helps teens transition from high school to college and adulthood with special em emphasis on mental wellness and emotional preparedness and brain futures. She holds a bachelor's of science degree for, in elementary education from Pennsylvania State University and a master of science degree in environmental education from Nova Southeastern University. Amy was born in Atlantic City and grew up in Pleasantville and Absecon. She and her husband, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, live in Southern New Jersey with their five children. Uh, welcome and for those who do not know you, please tell us three things that you'd like our audience to know. Oh, well, you, you gave me such a good intro. I was thinking I would tell a little bit about myself, but you know, I think one of the things that is really important to know about me is that I am local. I have lived here my whole life. My family's been in this area uh, for four generations. In fact, my great-grandparents had businesses in Atlantic City and it's my experience in the classroom in Atlanta County, right at that Mill Road School that many of you know in Northfield, that made me think more about how we could do mental health in schools because I taught middle school. You know, it's just that age when 
students are starting to show signs that they're struggling, um, the trauma that maybe they've experienced throughout their lives comes to a head as they're maturing. And we could be doing a lot more to intervene early. And we also know that there's a whole lot of prevention pieces. And as you read in the bio, uh, there's great organizations like Mental Health America who are focused on screening and on providing resources, but we also could really double down on our prevention efforts. And I think that starts with our focus on high quality childcare and universal pre-K, things that could benefit all of us and really help with the foundation of our youth. Um, something else about me is that I uh, absolutely love ice cream, mm -hmm. all sweets, in fact. I am big on homemade baked goods. Anything um, dessert related wins me over. So that is important part of every evening. And I would say my other focus that leads into this is my kids, you know, having five kids of my own, uh, that's where those two things come together, the dessert <laughs> and the education piece, right? It, because I am uh, always happy to have something at the end of the day that I can hold out as a reward after we're doing this homeschooling for the next few months, I'll be relying on that. So that's three things about me and the family. And I, um, I'm glad to be with you here today. I have a question about that. So as a mother who has a sweet tooth, how do you stop your kids from eating the sweets if you like sweets too? Yeah, we, I mean, we definitely have dessert every night after dinner, um, but it's kind of trying to limit it to just one time a day. So it's, mm. this is the time of year where we're at the beach a lot and the ice cream man is walking up and down the beach and that's pretty tempting. So it, they kind of know the rule that if, if there's a day where we do get ice cream on the beach, that's the thing that they've chosen and maybe we won't have it later, but I can't say no to at least one, one treat a day. I mean, mm -hmm. it's moderation, but we got to do it. I think the president and I agree. We both yeah. like sweet. Well, listen, uh, she had me. Any person who likes ice cream, I'm for them. Me too. <laughs> Any <laughs> flavor. I'm not even picky, you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm a butter pecan and coffee man myself for ice cream, but, but that, that's good. I like uh, Amy, let me ask you this question. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about mental health, and that's one of your concerns. In the uh, uh, communities of color, Mental health is an issue that, unfortunately, we don't talk enough about. What would you like to see done or advise those of us in leadership in communities of color with regard to mental health issues? There's a couple of really important things, I think. Uh, one, the this virus has done some positive things in terms of opening up access. So telemental health is more available now than ever. And it also means that we're able to uh, kind of seek out health professionals that represent you and that would be more consistent with whoever it is, whether you want to find a woman or if you want to find a male provider, if you want to find somebody from your community, it's going to be easier to do that when we can use telemental health and we have a broader range of people to choose from and also more specific to your need when it comes to uh, maybe what you're dealing with, what, what kind of trauma or experience you're facing. So I think that's helpful, but we need to continue to push that those doors stay open, that once the virus is passed, that we don't go back to restricting how the reimbursements are done. We need to make sure that um, if we push for more mental health and we ask people to seek that mental health, that the service is there when they go to find it. And I think that's our biggest struggle because people are willing and becoming more willing, especially young people to seek mm -hmm. out treatment. And yet there are so few providers and especially in communities of color that would represent that community. We need to encourage people into this field. One through, I think more incentives in loan forgiveness, making sure that we talk about it and that we're getting people to be trained as licensed clinical social workers, that 
They're trained as psychologists, psychiatrists, and uh, even EMTs are getting a lot more training. We know that it's also going to be important that we continue to um, inform and engage our faith communities because a lot of what we do, we know is about listening, it's about gratitude, it's about having faith, um, and it's that network, people not feeling isolated, especially at this moment when people have felt isolated and alone that the stress and anxiety can become unbearable. So relying on those faith networks, but also making sure that they are getting some professional development where it's necessary. Uh, we know that even librarians are getting this kind of professional development because they oftentimes see people in crisis and mm -hmm. looking for other ways that we can train those people who are our first responders or who are trusted already in our community like a pastor. Thank you. Let me ask another question before I turn it over to Yolanda. Uh, on the unusual Saturday session, the Congress voted on HR 8015 for, for the Postal Service, giving the Postal Service more money uh, and trying to push back on some of the changes in the uh, Postal Service. If you had the chance to vote on that bill, how would you have voted and why? Yeah, I would absolutely have supported uh, that post office bill because it's it's so key to the fabric of our country that we have not only the postal service, but this way to connect with each other when there are vital services, not only in this upcoming vote, but just on a daily basis, especially during a virus. This has been the way that people have gotten a lot of their supplies, whether it's medicine or food, and it employs many veterans. It, helps veterans get their medicines. So there's a, a lot tied in to making sure that our post office remains functioning. And we know that they've been uh, the target of kind of many um, debates about whether or not they're viable, but there are very few other systems that are asked to fund their own pensions years, 75 years in advance, like it's been done with the post office. So we need to look at why they've struggled and see how we can strengthen and build it up. It's not enough to just um, stop kind of the sabotaging that's been happening to date. We need to make sure that we're bolstering the post office so that it can continue to be that lifeline for people going forward. Thank you, I appreciate that, Amy. In my uh, council hat, one of the uh, senior developments in my ward, they called me and the people had not gotten mail, they said for two weeks. And that was a severe uh, point of distress for me. And that's what made me start moving on that. So I, I appreciate that answer. Yolanda? Thank you. And yeah. as I was listening to both you and Freeholder Fitzpatrick, it came to mind that a lot of times people don't know what county commissioners or freeholders do. And a lot of people don't know what congressional candidates do or con Congress people do. But you do handle uh, federal legislation when it comes to the post office. And one thing that is common to both of you is voting. And yeah. there is a, a bill, it's up for vote, it's called the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill, but this is, you know, the iteration, the several, several-ish inth of iteration of the Voting Rights Bill of 1965, which we, as we're in the 100th year of women's suffrage, we're in the 55th year of the passage of the initial Voting Rights Bill. Mm -hmm. But we know that in 2013, the Supreme Court made some changes and mm -hmm. asked for Congress to step back in again so we have before us the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And what would be your position if you were elected to Congress on that bill? I think that there would just be uh, no more appropriate way to honor his legacy than through this voting rights bill. I had the chance to uh, meet him several times. Uh, he had served with my husband, Patrick, and mm -hmm. Of course, I got to listen to him speak. It was um, five years after Hurricane Katrina. They did kind of a, a great um, event down in New Orleans and Ruby Bridges was there and President Obama came and, and John Lewis, of course, and John Lewis talked as, you know, it was a story that I know he's told lots of times, but I got to hear it 
live, you know, and that's a different thing when you get to hear somebody that's as powerful as a public speaker as he is. And he talked about, you know, how he used to preach to the chickens and, you know, the whole, his regular, it was his regular story, but it was just like, I got to listen to that and his legacy of, of standing up for what's right and making sure that people have access to vote could not be more important than it is this year. This moment, we need to be focused on how we ensure uh, a, not only a big turnout, but that people are not being um, afraid to, to exercise that right and suppressed from voting, which is what I think so many of us fear is happening with these intimidation tactics that we're seeing in this upcoming election. I watched uh, in the primary where so many people were waiting in those long lines throughout this country. And I think in New Jersey, we've all felt very lucky that um, isn't the reality that I've ever experienced here, but it's times have uh, made us all kind of on edge. What is next? What's happening? And is this the same experience that we're going to have in the future? And how can we just make it easier? Because what we saw in the primary here was that with the vote by mail, um, there were very few interruptions and there was a really great turnout on both the Republican side and the Democrat side. Right. So this really is not a partisan issue. Both Democrats and Republicans participated in the primary. And I would support that John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act because it could restore important voter protections and block all those efforts that we're seeing to prevent eligible citizens from voting. You know, those are uh, the people we want more engagement. We know it'll benefit our country when people are engaged and focused. And I think that they are right now. So how do we ensure that they have free elections that are fair and accessible to all Americans? It's a, it's a great legacy. We have to protect it. President, do you have another question? Right. Uh, one of the uh, issues that people are very concerned about across the country, and we in the NACP also, uh, yeah. Amy, is about the relationship with the police. Uh, first of all, just let me say for the record, uh, we don't believe that the police should be defunded. That's not our national position, our state position. It's not our local position. But we do believe that there needs to be a reimagining and possibly a renegotiation of how we interact with the police. And, and let me also say, the chief of police in Lang City is an executive member of the NACP executive committee. So we have respect for the police. We know uh, that the uh, police uh, are something that we need in our society. My question is this, uh, first of all, two part. Uh, I, Jacob Blake, who was the gentleman who got uh, paralyzed in Wisconsin, what is your reaction to that? And then number two, second part of that, how do you see us uh, on the federal level, uh, if you're uh, fortunate enough to get there, dealing with police? <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, thank you. And, and thanks for stating that position so clearly. I, I agree that I don't support defunding police departments, but I do think, you know, as you stated, that this has been a time in our country's history where uh, we are absolutely at a crossroads. And we know that we are seeing families like Jacob Blake's who are struggling right now with whether or not he's going to make a full recovery. And, you know, to imagine that this is happening uh, routinely is, is something that I, I w would hope we can all work together and get behind and say, there are, there are clear changes that have to happen, that that should be clear to all sides. But what I think we're seeing is, um, you know, a pitting of people against each other instead mm -hmm. of an acknowledgement that, you know, there needs to be more training, that we need to address the systematic racism that we're seeing in our society, but also in our police departments. And that we know 
this is not isolated to just police departments, that this right. is something that's happened in our country in all systems, but that we clearly have to make reforms to uh, policing and to our criminal justice system and make sure that in addition to um, the investments that we've made in traditional policing that we're doing other things to keep our communities safe. And so when I talked earlier about mental health, I think that many of the issues that we see before we ever um, engage the police that we could be addressing by making sure that we're providing more services for mental health and substance use disorders, which are at the heart of, of so much of the angst that we see in our country. And if we could address those, that it wouldn't be um, putting police officers in the position of having to respond to these crises. We also know that it's going to be important that we do the bias training, that we are moving forward in a way that's going to have everybody at the table. And I think that, um, you know, right now what I'm seeing instead is kind of Republicans using this as a talking point and trying to uh, portray everyone that's, that's trying to examine how we could do better as you know, lawless as absolutely in the effort of trying to um, create chaos and disorder. And it couldn't be further from the truth. I think what we're looking for is equity, is um, compassion, is how we can um, keep families safe, including families like Jacob Blake. And we want to, we want to do that and move forward um, as one country that can acknowledge where there's issues and work on that. And so I, I'm discouraged right now, frankly, by, by kind of how this has been turned into a, a partisan issue. And, um, and I know that there are a lot of people in law enforcement who are um, also feeling kind of, you know, on the outs when they, when they're hearing a lot of this conversation and, and it's been difficult to uh, bring everybody together to really work towards solutions. And I hope that that's what I can do in Congress. I've always been willing to listen and get input. And this is a place where we certainly need to do that. Amy, it's been very interesting having you. Uh, uh, your compassion and your uh, common sense comes through. We have 30 seconds. Would you like to make a closing comment? Thank you. Um, just that everybody make sure you have dessert tonight. Uh, we know <laughs> that that will that will help. And and you know in in Brigantine, I I posted. Um, we've had just a, a rough time here in Brigantine this week. We lost our mayor, um, oh, yeah, and yeah. we lost uh, we lost a law enforcement officer this week. We lost. Um, somebody in the service this week and just having uh, and another um, through a tragic um, domestic dispute and it's been um, a trying time for our whole country you know not just Brigantine but our whole country and I am anxious to see us move forward and you know as somebody who just loves South Jersey and wants to, and believes that we deserve better I think that there's an opportunity uh, with Joe Biden and with this whole ticket, including Karen, to, to make real change for this area. Thank you, Amy Kennedy. Thank you, Karen Fitzpatrick. Uh, thank you, Mayor Smalls, earlier. Uh, Yolanda, that's the end of our show. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. See you next week. Thank you.